If you're metabolically challenged, then you know that handling sugar is your nemesis. The drama begins when you sit down for dinner. A bite of an ordinary sandwich can leave you with a sugar spike, and a piece of lemon meringue pie can put you in a glucose-induced stupor for hours, shredding blood vessels and putting you at risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event. As your biology deteriorates, the problem extends to high fasting blood glucose levels and culminates in a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, which comes with a long list of nasty complications. Aish. Now, it's not just your sugars that are off. Your fat metabolism is wonky too. And although the details might be a little fuzzy, you also know that the fat side of your metabolism is not functioning correctly. This is why you're continually being told to avoid saturated fat. Now, the fuzziness comes from the fact that the connection between dietary fat and circulating fat is not linear. For the most part, the fat problem is homemade, uh, something that's not always appreciated by the experts. But what about the third macronutrient? Protein. I mean, it's not something that's talked about too often. And when it is, fasting levels are the focus. Now, fasting levels are not 100% normal. One particular family of amino acids, the branch chain amino acids, runs high. It is seen as a problem, but how much of a problem is still debated. The current thinking is that it's related to cool furnaces. They're just simply not being burned. And this is more a consequence of insulin resistance rather than a cause. Now, the rest of the amino acid levels are all within the normal range, with one notable exception, glycine. Glycine levels are often down, and this does have its own set of consequences. You can learn more here. This brings us to the question, well, what happens to amino acid levels when you eat? The prediction is, well, they should be high. After all, insulin's job is to put away the groceries, and amino acids are one of the groceries insulin is in charge of. When you're insulin resistant, the response to insulin is rather lackluster, which is what's leaving the sugars floating in the circulation, and amino acids. Right? No, it's a case of the amino acids behaving badly. When you're metabolically challenged, the post-meal amino acid levels are down. Join us for this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we explore this very counterintuitive, dare I say, shocking discovery and contemplate what it means for the metabolically challenged. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster, helping you battle sugar gremlins, heifer lumps, and other health horribles through better body chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. Now, this finding on the postprandial amino acid levels being low came from the Netherlands Epidemiology of Obesity Study. This is actually a pretty big ongoing study, which included 6,771 people, and it was designed to investigate the pathways that lead to obesity-related disease. In 2008, when the study began, the people were divided into three groups. They were the metabolically healthy, the metabolically challenged, who at that time were glucose intolerant, and then the metabolically broken, who had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. In this particular experiment, a subset of these people were fed a liquid mixed meal composed of 16% protein, 50% carbs, 
and 34% fat. A blood sample was drawn at the 150 minute mark and the amino acid levels recorded. Here are the results. The green is the data for the normals, the blue is what happens when people are glucose intolerant, and the maroon is what happened in people with type 2 diabetes. I know the writing is a bit small, but it's clear that there is always something different about the levels. And there's definitely a dose response effect. In other words, the more disturbed your metabolism is in terms of sugar control, the more disturbed your postprandial amino acid levels are. And a few amino acids are more sensitive to the disturbance, suggesting that something about their biology is important. Now, is it a case of checkmate or simply a delay in the check-in? Who knows? It's actually not something that has been contemplated much, and it definitely needs to be. We don't know if it can or even if it should be fixed. This was beyond the scope of this research. It is possible that the decrease simply reflects a timing issue. Of course, on the other hand, it may be very real, with downstream consequences, such as unstimulated muscles. Amino acid availability has profound effects on many aspects of cell function, including the control of membrane transport mechanisms, cell signaling, and gene expression. In the case of skeletal muscle, we know only when the circulating levels of amino acids are high enough does muscle synthesis happen. This makes muscles acutely sensitive to circulating amino acid levels, and a lower muscle mass is something that characterizes the metabolically challenged. The question is, could the lower amino acid levels, alongside with the delivery issues, be compromising the anabolic signal, leading to less muscle mass and a shortage of sugar cupboards, leaving more sugar molecules with nowhere to go? I think it's a distinct possibility. And the consequences don't stop here. The situation could be giving your muscles the munchies. It's known that amino acid availability also plays a role in appetite regulation. If amino acid availability is lower, you could be tempted to eat more. And then the lower levels of specific amino acids, such as glycine, serine, and histidine, may bring consequences of their own. And isn't it interesting? Shortages of glycine, histidine, and serine have been implicated in diabetic complications. Now, there's plenty of science that suggests more protein is helpful, especially in people who are metabolically challenged. Could this simply be fixing the problem? But <laughs> before you start to load up on protein, it's important to realize that excess protein is not always helpful and on occasion can be hurtful. Protein is a Goldilocks nutrient. You want to steer clear of too much while at the same time avoiding the prospect of getting too little. Now, despite the rhetoric, it's quite conceivably possible that if you are metabolically challenged, too little might be a real thing. Hedge your bets. Make sure you are getting enough protein to keep your cells happy and healthy. The easiest way to do this is to obey the rule of thirds. Make sure that you eat a little bit of protein every time you eat. And let's hope this research sparks more research into what is happening to protein metabolism. It's not normal and it's complicated. Insulin and glucagon may play on opposite teams at night, but at dinner time, they're collaborating. Need a little guidance on how to apply the rule of thirds to your life? Join the lab, Better Body Chemistry's community, to get the help and support you need to create better body chemistry and better health. Or if you want a more personalized help, book a one-on-one -on -one health conversation with Dr. Sandy.
you can find the link in the description below. Better body chemistry is your birthright. Visit our website and study up on all the low-cost, low-cost things you can do to improve your body chemistry. The advice is simple to follow and based on real science, not hype. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.